Thank you very much for watching Palestine Studies TV. I'm your host, Clea Twain. In today's episode, I'm joined by Bernard Sabella, a professor of sociology at the University of Bethlehem and a member of the Palestinian Legislative Council. We'll be talking about the dwindling Christian community in the occupied territories, an issue that was recently highlighted in a segment aired by CBS's 60 Minutes. Professor Sabella, thank you very much for being with us today. It's a pleasure, indeed. Professor Sabella, could you start by giving us a brief overview of the situation of Christians in Palestine today? Uh, Christians in Palestine are uh, it more or less around 160,000. Uh, we are talking about 50,000 in the Palestinian territories, West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza Strip, and around 110,000 within Israel proper. So in British mandated Palestine, the territory of British mandated Palestine, we're talking today about roughly 160,000 Palestinian Christians. And these Christians belong to 13 different denominations, uh, the largest of which uh, overall is a Greek uh, Catholic Melkite uh, community because they are the majority, overwhelming majority in Galilee. And you know, Galilee is where it all started really, Nazareth, you know. And, uh, and uh, also in the Palestinian territories, you have a majority of Greek Orthodox, a slight majority of Greek Orthodox. And the Greek Orthodox are really belonging to the church, but they are native Arabic speaking Palestinians who have been there for uh, really uh, since I can say the the birth of Jesus and the start of the church back in the first century. So there's been a lot of talk recently about this segment that was aired by CBS uh, called the, the Christians in the Holy Land. Uh, and one of the criticisms that has emerged is that uh, they see that program as overemphasizing Christians' religious identity uh, at the expense of their national identity. And so in that way, it kind of sets them apart from the broader Palestinian community. Do you agree with that? No, I do not agree with that. It's, it's, simply, it's simply highlighting a problem that is impacting, uh, especially in the Bethlehem area, uh, the uh, trend towards emigration. And since we are worried about the dwindling number of Palestinian Christians, then I think it is very important to highlight that. And, and in fact, in various surveys undertaken, Palestinian Christians present themselves first and foremost as Palestinians and not as Christians. So, so they take they take more the, the nationalist position, but at the same time, at the same time, we we are having a, a problem with with the fact that uh, uh, emigration is uh, taking a toll on the Christian numbers, Christian Palestinian numbers, and therefore there is a need to highlight that this uh, emigration is caused among other things, but primarily by the political situation of occupation, by the fact that Christians in Bethlehem and Muslims cannot access Jerusalem, and that, uh, and that there, there is an overall concern uh, that the uh, use uh, of Israel, of the uh, pretext of security, is making of security a sacred cow, so to speak, that is used whenever, whenever uh, uh, you know, measures that are against basic human rights are undertaken, like access to holy sites and access to the Holy Sepulchre and to Jerusalem, whether uh, to the Aqsa Mosque or to the churches. 
So I want to talk a bit more about this question of emigration. Uh, you said that there are today 160,000 Christians in historic Palestine. How different was that situation in 1948? Now, in 1945, uh, there was a survey undertaken by the Anglo-American uh, Commission of Inquiry that came to Palestine. And in that survey, the numbers of Christians in Palestine in 1945 was 145,000. Today, in Palestine, the same geographic uh, entity you are talking about 160,000. And some people say, ah, but you see, there, there is no decline of Christians. No, there is. Because in 1948, when the war erupted, there were close to 90,000 Palestinian Christians who were dislodged from their homes, 60,000 of whom became refugees, like my own family, you know? And 30,000 Palestinian Christians became displaced within what became the state of Israel. And some of them till today cannot go back to their villages and to their homes. So there was a big dislocation and dislodgement of Palestinian Christians at that time. In addition, if we go by the growth rate of population, Today, in, if all the Christians, 145,000 Christians back in 45, remained in Palestine till this day, then we'll have over half a million Palestinian Christians in the Palestinian territories. Today, you have only 160,000. So, yes, uh, you know, so, so there is a dilemma because almost two out of three Palestinian Christians are found outside their original home and their original country. And they are spread all over. And have Palestinian Muslims emigrated to the same extent, or is this a Palestinian Christian trend? A Palestinian emigration is, is a, a trademark of Palestinians, <laughs> whether it is, uh, whether it is the, the force, the refugee status, that most of us got in 1948, or the tradition of immigration. I'm not denying that there was always a tradition of migration out of Palestine. And it started in the Ottoman times, really. And the idea was, and, and some people even referred, uh, talk about uh, the uh, Chicago Exposition of 1824, or the Philadelphia Exposition of 1876 uh, as being uh, a, 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 the point whereby some Palestinian Christians, particularly from Bethlehem and Ramallah, chose to go to the U.S. because they saw the progress, they came with their wares, with their uh, touristic uh, crafts and arts and so on, and they saw how fantastic the USA, the good old USA was, you know. So, so they started uh, tracking. They started sending their kids uh, to the USA. And, uh, and uh, 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 from Bethlehem area, uh, some families chose to send their children, especially their, uh, uh, their firstborn, uh, so to speak, male firstborn, to Central and South America. And according to uh, uh, a Lebanese father who wrote on migration and immigration in Latin America, in Chile, uh, the Palest it was most likely that the person arriving in Chile towards the, the beginning of the 19th century, 20th, 20th century, would uh, meet three people, three Ps, as he said. Uh, a policeman, a, a priest, and most likely a Palestinian, you know. So, so, so the tradition of migration is there. Uh, but, uh, but what we are saying now is that the 
and not me, but uh, from various surveys that we have undertook, uh, people say they are leaving because of the political and economic situation. So when the economic situation, like in Bethlehem, with the tourists coming and so on, is uh, advancing, you know, and it's good, uh, there is likelihood uh, that uh, less and less young people think about leaving. So it's all tied to politics and economics, really. Uh, in a March op-ed, the Israeli ambassador, Michael Oren, claimed that uh, Islamist fundamentalism was to blame for the Christian immigration. Uh, could you maybe expand a bit more on Muslim-Christian relations in Palestine? The Christian-Muslim relations in Palestine, without being, you know, utopian about it, uh, are good relations. And in fact, in fact, uh, you know, I was asked a question about persecution and so on. And I said, look at Bethlehem. I mean, you know, who has economic power in Bethlehem? Still maintain economic power. Christian families in Bethlehem today, you know. So if there have been persecution, then the economic part of it would be first hit. But we don't have that. And, and I, one doesn't need to to re-emphasize this point. But Christian-Muslim relations in Palestine have been excellent. Uh, they have been, uh, you know, uh, we do not have uh, problems. We see our, uh, uh, in fact, Palestinian Christians would tell you that we are an integral part of our Palestinian society. We are proud to be professors. We are proud to work in education in health, in uh, legal professions, in uh, even human rights uh, organizations, uh, because we feel we are part of the Palestinian experience. And we don't see that there is uh, a, 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 what, what is referred to as uh, the persecution or as uh, uh, trying to uh, pin us in a corner because we are Christians. You know, uh, that is not happening. Having said this, uh, certainly uh, there would be incidents in which Christians and Muslims are involved, and then some would use that to religionize, if you wish, the whole problem. But uh, Muslims and Muslims have similar problems, and Christians and Christians have similar problems. So I, I don't like it when you reduce the cause of a problem or friction within the community to strictly a religious cause. Uh, and therefore, I cannot see that the Palestinian Christians are leaving because of religion. I see more Palestinian Christians leaving because of the political and economic situation. I mean, the wall itself, and I'm not going to start uh, uh, crying over the wall, but uh, I remember a Jewish friend of mine from Chicago coming one time, and he said, I was absolutely shocked when I saw the wall surrounding Bethlehem. So, but beside the shock, for young Palestinians from Bethlehem, from Ramallah, uh, who cannot access Jerusalem, and who are limited in what they can do, then this would be a reason to, to leave, especially if, if the political situation becomes stance and uh, the, uh, uh, the alternative becomes that the economics is bad and therefore uh, uh, young people think about leaving. So we mentioned Michael Oren uh, a few minutes ago. You're actually part of a group, uh, Kairos, a group of Palestinian Christians that issued a response to his op-ed. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about what Kairos is and what its mission is? What Kairos is a document that came out of deliberations that went on for over one year or two years in Jerusalem and Bethlehem. And it gathered around 20 to 25 heads of churches and primarily lay Palestinian Christians. And the concern was 
with the ongoing continuing occupation and political stalemate, okay, where do we go? And the message of Kairos was really a challenge that a challenge to Israelis, but as well to Palestinians and to Christians worldwide, that we need to move forward and we cannot really be stuck in a stalemate political situation that generates injustice and that leads to infractions on basic rights, whether movement or whatever. And, and the basic message, in my opinion, was that we, as Palestinian Christians, do not hate Israelis, but we do not like occupation. And the Kairos document, essentially, was one calling for uh, Israelis also to move forward, but also calling on Christians worldwide uh, to take part in active steps, non-violent steps, in order to end the uh, Israeli occupation. I want to talk about that, uh, the fact that the document addresses Christians worldwide, especially those who use theology to legitimize the occupation. Why do you think conservative American Christians relate more to Israeli Jews than they do to their fellow Christians in Palestine? basically because of the uh, biblical narrative that really forgets about uh, 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 injustices. In other words, you, you, there are some who use the biblical narrative to justify whatever injustices and infractions, human rights infractions, are perpetrated by uh, the Israeli occupation of them. And this in itself is counter to the uh, Christian tradition. In fact, I was a uh, part of the uh, Middle East Synod that took place in October in 2010 in the Vatican. And this point specifically was mentioned and saying we cannot use the Bible to justify any infraction. Yes, there is this theological affinity between the Old Testament, which is the Torah, the Hebrew Torah, and the New Testament. And nobody denies that, not even Palestinian Christians. But our argument is that you cannot use the biblical argument to justify oppression and occupation of another people. And therefore, the challenge here is how do you get Israelis and religious Israelis in, in particular, as well as those who call themselves Christian Zionists, to take a look at, at the whole argument and to say, what is the salvation for Israel and what is the salvation for Christians? And that, in our opinion, as Palestinian Christians, lies not in justifying infractions and oppression and occupation, but in coming to terms with the realities of occupation and overcoming these realities by giving Palestinians, by uh, offering to Palestinians the prospects of a national state. And this has not happened till today. Uh, do you see that situation changing? Do you think attitudes may be changing? Well, I think I, think I always say that if you are a Christian Zionist, and if you care about Israel, then you should care about Palestinians. Because unless you care about Palestinians, and you can care about Israelis, then you cannot advance peace prospects here. I remember I had one time a very rough argument uh, with an Israeli professor who was arguing that the battle really is between Islam and Judaism and Christianity on the other side. And I told him, uh, listen, uh, you, you, you are religionizing the whole conflict. The conflict is not about religion. Uh, yes, there are theological and religious dimensions to the conflict, 
But the conflict in its spirit is nationalistic and real estate over land. And it's not over religion. And we Palestinian Christians have, as I told you before, we have affinity with the Old Testament. But that doesn't mean that we, uh, having experienced what we have experienced as refugees, as Palestinian refugees, would go along with the biblical narrative that justify the pain, the suffering, and the victimhood that our parents went through. And my argument is that if you use the religious argument again and again, then you are preparing the word not only to Armageddon as narrated or prescribed by the Old Testament or by those who interpret the Old Testament this way, but you are going to bring disaster to everybody in this part of the world. So the vision, the Christian vision, is a Christian, is a vision that seeks peace and justice and not only speak to the needs, conditions of life, but peace and justice to Palestinians irrespective. Because without peace and justice to Palestinians, you're not going to have security for Israel. Not in the short term, not in the long term. So you've already touched on this in, in your previous answers, but I just want to conclude by asking you what the future holds for Palestinian Christians. Well, what holds for Palestinian Christians is what holds for all Palestinians. I mean, there is no really difference. And as I look forward, you know, and as I see that we are living in a political stalemate, I wonder whether we are all going to make it in the sense to live in this part of the world, Israel and Palestine, as two neighbors at peace with each other. But this necessitates changing minds, changing attitudes. It also necessitates having a leadership in Israel that has a real vision for peace with the Palestinians and that does not look at us Palestinians as, as, as being a people to be controlled and not to have their freedom and independence. Professor Sabella, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us on Palestine Studies TV. Thank you, and all the best.